Hello there, welcome to Field Study, an exploration of food and the landscape. So even though we're in the midst of the winter, it's freezing cold and incredibly windy, uh, I'm out today to show you that there is still stuff that is good to forage for. So stay tuned and I'll be showing you three edible plants that are good to forage for right now in the middle of January. Stay tuned. So the first plant we come across is this, which is three-cornered leek, uh, which is a member of the onion family. So as with all members of the onion family, it's got this singular grass-like leaf structure that goes off into a point. And if you pick one of the leaves, you'll see that three-cornered leek is named so because it has this ridge that goes down the back that gives the leaf a three-cornered triangular structure. So as with lots of the allium family, many of your wild onions, uh, the true way to identify it is by its smell. Now three-cornered leek is like uh, green spring onions, or uh, wet garlic, green garlic, if you, if you eat garlic before it's cured. It's not as strong as wild garlic, but it's got lovely uh, green chlorophyll sort of flavor notes going on. And it's beautiful if you lacto-ferment it. Um, so you put a bunch of it in a jar with about 20% salt and just let it ferment away. And it's excellent for your gut and it doesn't taste half bad either. A couple of poached eggs on some toast with some lacto-fermented three-cornered leek with some uh, lovely chili flakes on top is beautiful you can eat the flowers when it flowers and it is actually quite invasive as a plant uh, people plant it in their gardens and one of the things that they're advised to do is to keep it under control because it does tend to spread and form these large ground cover mats which is fantastic if you're a forager because it means that there is a plentiful supply of food so one of the best things about this is that it's out before wild garlic and can be used in many of the same ways. So lots of the uh, recipes that you have for wild garlic, you can use three-cornered leek instead and get cracking. Right, let's carry on the walk and see what else we can find. So here on this dead elder tree next to me, we have one of the most abundant fungi in the UK, and it's relatively safe for beginner foragers. So it's one of my favorites to teach people, and it is the jelly ear mushroom. So it grows on dead or dying elder trees, and it has this cup-like structure. Uh, the cups will always face downwards. Um, that's how you distinguish it from some of the other cup fungi out there. And it's got this wibbly wobbly jelly-like texture. So you're looking for dead or dying elder trees. Um, and you're looking for these downward facing sort of tawny brown cups with this really strange gelatinous texture. <laughs> Squatting. Jeepers. Ah, oh, my knees. <laughs> Forager squat. I'm squatting down here because it is so windy out there and my other microphone decided to die. So we're stuck with this one. Uh, now the, the mushroom in itself doesn't actually taste of that much. It's faintly mushroomy, but with the jelly ear, it is all about the texture. It's got a, a sort of wobbly, gelatinous, but crunchy texture. Uh, there's a, a little bit of resistance and then your tooth goes through it and it's really satisfying. In, in an odd sort of way. Uh, definitely something to experience. Some people hate it, some people love it. Um, it's very, very popular in some Eastern cuisines. Uh, I think the relative of it, or the one that they sell it as in the, the shops is the, the cloud ear mushroom. And you put it in broth, soup, stews, that sort of thing. Um, and these are just as good and they're free and you can get them fresh. Now the thing to do with these is to pick them, take them home and dry them out. They'll shrivel up. Uh, sometimes I like to slice them up if you've got some big ones before I dry them out and then you sprinkle them in your lovely noodle broth or something like that and they'll rehydrate and go back to that lovely crunchy jelly-like texture. When they're dried out like that they also take on other flavours really really well. So if you rehydrate them in uh, a stock or something like that you can um, impart lots of lovely flavour. What I like to do if I'm rehydrating porcini mushrooms is I will whack a few of the dried jelly ears in there and then I'll dry out the jelly ears again if it's the time of year that I've got the dehydrator going on full whack 
and uh, the jelly ear will actually take on some of the flavor of the porcini mushroom. So, <laughs> so when you start to run out of porcini, then at least you can impart some of that flavor into your cooking. Now, when you start to learn about mycology and foraging for mushrooms and stuff, uh, it really hammers home the fact that you should know the trees around you and how to identify them. Now, this isn't the video where I'm gonna talk about that, uh, but you will always find this mushroom growing on elder trees. So before going out, learn your elder tree and uh, you'll be able to hone in on the spots where these guys exist. The other great thing about these is that you'll find them all year round. So they are important this time of year when there isn't much else, especially in the, uh, in the mushroom world going on. Um, but you can find them even in the warmer months of the year, which is amazing. If you've had a, a dry spell, they will shrivel up on the tree and then as soon as you have some some rain or the dry spell breaks then they will be reinvigorated and rehydrate themselves and that's when to go out picking them so if you have a long hot spell and then some rain uh, go out and gather your, your jelly ear mushrooms So the third and final plant that I'm getting excited about this month is this, which is Alexander's, which is a, a beautifully aromatic uh, member of the carrot family. Now a word of warning, uh, as with all members of the carrot family, I wouldn't recommend them for beginner foragers because there are some uh, deadly members out there that can um, look a little bit similar if you don't know what you're foraging for. So Alexander's or Smyrnum ostriatum, I think, um, is a beautiful vegetable and in fact it is a non-native invasive species that was brought over to the UK by the Romans. Uh, so this plant originates from uh, the Mediterranean and is used as a vegetable and uh, a herb plant all the way across Europe. Um, and it's because the Romans used to use it in their vegetable gardens, it was then carried on by uh, Benedictine monks used to grow it in monasteries, etc. And yeah, it's been used as a food plant all the way up until we cultivated celery, which has a, a milder flavour. So the first word of this plant's Latin binomial, smyrnum, uh, refers to myrrh. So like gold, frankincense and myrrh, uh, myrrh is a wonderfully pungent, fragrant, incense-like thing. And uh, because this is an aromatic plant, it sort of shares some of the same qualities. Um, so it was named such. So if you know what you're doing when foraging for Alexander's, it is definitely worth going and looking at your Alexander spots now um, because there are lots of lovely shoots coming up. And these shoots are really lovely and tender, um, super fragrant and delicate and excellent for sprinkling into salads. It's absolutely amazing. So people uh, describe it as smelling like pepper and it does have that sort of um, fragrant quality to it. I mean, the seeds when you grind them down can be used as a substitute for peppercorns for seasoning food. So whilst there is a black pepper thing going on on the nose, uh, for me, it smells like um, grapefruit and all of them uh, modern aromatic hops that are coming across from America and American IPAs. Smells like a pint of beer from Beak Brewery down in East Sussex. And it is beautiful. So sprinkling these in a winter salad is absolutely lovely. So in about three weeks time, I'm gonna be doing an in-depth video on uh, the identification of Alexander's and all of its culinary uses. So before you pick your Alexander's or other members of the carrot family, it is important. In fact, it is imperative to go and learn their toxic cousins. Um, there are some extremely toxic members of this family, such as hemlock water dropwort and hemlock. Um, and hemlock water dropwort is so toxic that about six leaves will kill you in about eight hours. Um, so it really isn't one to be messed with. So go out and learn its toxic cousins before you even consider going foraging for Alexander's. And there we go, that's my scary warning out of the way. So there we go, that is three things that you can forage for now, even though it is absolutely freezing. So I'm gonna go home and warm my bones by the fire, um, and I'm gonna cook up some Alexander's to have with some partridge that I've got in the fridge. Uh, very exciting stuff. I hope you guys have a good week. If you missed the first episode of the Field Study Podcast, I'll leave a link in the description below. So go and check that out, uh, give me some feedback, um, and another episode of that will be coming next week. Right, until next week, Take care.